This conference will now be this conference will now be recorded. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Ken Poisson, Sixth District Councilman and Council Chairman Pro Tem. I will be running the meetings tonight because Councilman Chairman Pia is having a scheduled surgery today and he is unavailable. I'm going to open up the public forum of September 14th, 2020 at 6.50 p.m. Margo, we're all set. You can start calling people. Okay, so we're going to we're gonna start with Reverend Lord. Good evening, hey, everybody. Council. Reverend, sorry to interrupt you. Just a general reminder for everybody to please state your name and address when you are called, and everybody has a three-minute time limit. Thank you. Okay. Reverend Lord. Go ahead, Reverend. Uh, yep. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, Greater Bridgeport NAACP president. We all know why we are here. Uh, in reference to the post that was posted this past week uh, by Sergeant Rivera, stating that the Black Lives Matter movement was a racist organization. Most of us know that is not the truth. It is not a racist organization. It was brought about because of the ills of the black community that we feel that we have been subjected to by police throughout the nation. So and the idea is not to be against the police. It is more that our lives matter as black people because uh, our lives haven't mattered. We've been, we've, we're more marginally health-wise. We're more marginally treated when it comes to being arrested. We're more largely treated when it comes to education for our, our students of color. So we definitely oppose, as you know, the, the remarks or the post that was give, put out on Facebook. We Yes, we have met with Chief McNeil, and I will be tomorrow uh, uh, tomorrow morning meeting at for roll call tomorrow morning and also Wednesday at 4. We, we want to bring about a solution to this. We've called for some things within the police department. Everybody has seen out my uh, post on Facebook, so we're not going to go through all of that. But we would like the city council to act Swiftly, there has to be some ramifications for a, a man that holds a leadership role within the police department. There must be some consequences. That is for you to decide. We've already stated what we've asked for, but we want some resolution. And going forward, we expect to be a more, inc more inclusive within what happens at the Stratford Police Department and helping them also to help recruit uh, going for, for, forward candidates of color. So, so we thank you for your time and your patience. God bless each and every one of you, and please stay safe. Okay, thank you, Reverend. Okay, next up is Tina Manis. Hold on, Tina, while we find you so I can unmute you. I'm unmuted now. Hello. You are, Dr. You are Tina. unmuted. Okay. Dr. Tina Manis, 315 Fox Hill Road, Stratford, Connecticut. I'm speaking today in support of Councilwoman Shake's request that our mayor and this council make a clear statement that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist organization. I'm disappointed by the actions of the office but there's no middle road here. You either believe Black Lives Matter or you don't. You either acknowledge issues head on or you don't. You either step up or you step back. I appreciate the mayor's attempt to begin a conversation. That's not easy. But it also has the potential to create more harm, even with the best intentions. Please listen more and engage people in the conversation, even people you don't know. And maybe people you don't like. It's called educating yourself and gaining a wider perspective, something this town's government 
needs to learn to do. I have lived here for over 41 years. I get it. I'm part of the circle of people who have been here and grown up in Stratford. But experiences will change you. I had many experiences in my life outside of Stratford. I sought them out. I encourage you all to make new friends from different walks of life, of different races and backgrounds. Perhaps be the only person in the room who doesn't speak the language spoken at a meeting. Being the minority changed me in that way. I was also aware of how much compassion was shown for me because I didn't speak the language. Compassion I never showed to those people who spoke a different language. I mentioned it to them and they smiled and said, because we know how it feels. These are the experiences I've had with the Greater Bridgeport NAACP, Black Lives Matter organizations, Latino organizations, and every organization where I have walked in as the white ally and a minority. I may have grown up here, but those experiences, those things in my life, many of which I sought out myself to grow and change, that's how I grew. I grew up here, but I grew but I grew through the experiences I had with other people. And I encourage this administration and this council to get out of the circle. Get out of the people you know and start to talk to the people in the world around you that are wider than Stratford because the world is a big place and it's getting bigger by the minute. You can't ignore it anymore. It's at our front door and Stratford can either grow with this or not. And I think it's a really, really important time to usher in change and to bring about growth in Stratford. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Yolanda Mitchell. Hi, how are you? Um, just, just have a couple of quick questions. Um, I do feel the same as uh, Tina Manis spoke. Yolanda, um, I'm also, sorry. Yolanda, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let's please state your address for the record. I'm sorry, 40 Fresh Street, Stratford. Thank you. Um, I also do not like that it was not noted that from the mayor, Mayor Hoytick, that the Black Lives Matter movement um, is not a terrorist group. I don't like that that was not corrected because that's what they are not. Um, I also don't agree with Mayor Hordick when she said that this was not a quote unquote, or this was a, a terrible judgment um, from Sergeant Rivera. Um, I don't agree with that. I think this is exactly how he feels, and that's exactly why he voiced it, um, which is concerning to me as a minority uh, in, in the South End, because then it makes me wonder how can you, the government, the mayor, the police department ensure our safety before or should something happen. Um, we don't want anything to happen. We're not anti-police. Um, we just don't want to deal with this type of stuff. We, you know. Um, and then after this meeting, oh, I also wanted to know why the public is being included in a forum now versus beforehand. I think we would have liked to have had a voice um, as opposed to just a select few. And then lastly, uh, just what decisions plan to be made going forward after this public forum meeting. That's all. Okay, thank you. Next up is Donald Goodson. The uh, remark made by Officer, uh, oh, state my address. Donald Goodson, 409 Sherwood Place, Stratford, Connecticut. I'd just like to say I'm appalled by the controversial remarks made by the Stratford police officer, Jamie Javi Rivera, on his Facebook page last week. Officer Rivera's insensitive, and many people would say racist statements about the Black Lives Movement and those who support the rights of the movement to protest police brutality reflect poorly on his character and his, his judgment as a police officer. He calls the Black Lives Movement a terrorist organization, and he says that they call for the killing of police officers. How wrong can he be? 
The Black Lives Movement has been a peaceful, although there have been some, I call them agent provocateurs, who have attempted to subvert the goals of the organization. The Black Lives Movement has been a peaceful movement with legitimate reasons to protest the wrongdoing of a few errant police officers who reflect poorly on the entire police department. Officer Rivera's remarks seriously concern me and others with whom I've spoken to. These concerns can seriously affect his judgment and interactions with people of color in the community in which he serves. He apparently seems to be stressed. Perhaps he should seek the help of the city's uh, employees assistance program in order to re receive the help that he needs before a major incident comparable to Ferguson or Minneapolis or New York or Houston or Louisville and many other cities that have occurred throughout the country. I just like to say to the police department, the Stratford police department, remember this, that every crisis presents an opportunity. Here's the chance for the Stratford Police Department to work proactively with the Stratford's citizens addressing racial equity, which is called CARE, and the Greater Bridgeport Branch of the NAACP to address these types of issues before they arise again. I urge you to do a thorough investigation into this incident and to issue a report as to the actions taken to prevent any future incidents. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia Huber. Uh, hi, this is Sonia Huber from 75 Clinton Avenue in Stratford. Um, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, I've been a Stratford resident for nine years and I've enjoyed living here for its diversity and its community feeling. All of these are important values of civil society, and they are under attack when an officer of the law calls, calls a protest movement such as Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization. Black Lives Matter is a huge and peaceful movement with moms and dads and kids and teens and normal people from all walks of life participating in every state in the union. When someone is defined as a terrorist, they are classified as an enemy combatant and vulnerable to extrajudicial violence. Many of the people leading BLM protests around this country are children and teenagers. I've been at peaceful Black Lives Matter rallies in several cities, and I want us to all unequivocally be able to say that Black Lives Matter, that's the minimum. Uh, the BLM ra rally here in Stratford was huge and peaceful. Uh, this, so this officer was in effect also calling me a terrorist, which makes me and everyone else who supports BLM fear the police and assume that the police are not neutral and will not, will not protect the citizens. We, including the mayor and the city council, need to condemn this violation of the First Amendment and our civil liberties in the strongest man manner possible. What Black Lives Matter wants is merely for systemic racism and police brutality to be recognized for the poisons that they are, and for Black lives to get protections on par with what others in the U.S. enjoy. Without our right to protest and peaceably assemble, we are not a democracy. Thanks. Thank you. Stacy Tavares. Um, yes, Stacy Tavares, 1373 South Avenue. Um, yes, I'm a mother of a black man and grandmother, and I'm appalled at this officer's statement that Black Lives is a terrorist group. I think that this officer related this um, statement to a friend, a police, a fellow officer that was um, committed suicide, and I think that's a lame excuse. Um, if he really wanted to do something as far as uh, in honor of his friend, he should have went and sought help, as um, Mr. Goodson said, and as all the other people that have spoken have said, there's very other other ways other than um, really more hate and more vile um, statements like Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group. That is very out, um, outlandish. I think if this officer is, was either burnt out or stressed out, and that is still no excuse. And him being 17 years on the force, he has probably already had sensitivity training, and I don't know how um, he has 
uh, truly taking those things into account because him being a uh, officer of the law, we should not as community people have to fear, fear for our lives and wondering what type of cop we're going to have to um, be presented with for a basic traffic stop or anything or having someone come to our home because we have called. I think this is really appalling and I feel that he should be um, fired because this is something that you expect from someone that's on the force for one or two years, but not from a seasoned police officer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Linda Fernandez. Hello, I'm Linda Fernandez, 304 Stratford Avenue in Stratford, Connecticut. Um, I am concerned about the statement made by Officer Ramirez. I too am a grandmother of a 21 year old and it concerns me greatly when I have to instill in my grandson that if you're stopped by a police officer, just put your hands on the steering wheel and just say yes sir, no sir, that's a concern. He being officer as a, in a high rank, it concerns me as to what is he teaching officers under him. I'm concerned that maybe he's not teaching them the correct thing just by his statement that he made, which is a judgment statement. Yes, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but there's a way that you do things. There's a way that you bring things across and someone in his position should never have said anything of that sort. How do you expect people in our community to feel free to go to an officer if he feels black lives does not matter and they're a terrorist group? How do you expect young black men to engage in the program they have when an officer of the law comes out with a statement like that? I feel that the mayor should do something about it. And we as the community should know about it. Even though we claim to be a diverse community, really and truly we are not diverse. We're diverse in numbers, yes, but we're not diverse in unity. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kim Rice. Hi, uh, my name is Kimberly Rice. And um, I, uh, so I just wanted to start by saying first that this kind of, this whole situation kind of highlights the issues of racism within the town of Stratford, including the mayor and the Republican legislators' desire to celebrate a slave owner and the history of a slave owner and all of the atrocities. If the mayor and the the Republican legislators want to do that, that's a that's a problem in and of itself. Now the issue with the officer, <laughs> Black Lives Matter is only asking for equity and respect. And to this officer, Officer Rivera, asking for equity and respect is considered a terrorist action. Well, that in and of itself, man, that's, that's just disheartening all the way around. And so what I, what I would say is it highlights the need for police accountability, you know, that we're having this discussion all the way around. Um, and it also shows and demonstrates that we do need civilian review boards. And we should be looking at that officer's um, his work, who he's arrested and why he's arrested it, arrested those individuals, because it's important. He brings his belief systems into this, into his job. And this is a, this is a problem. Now in 2018, Trump signed an executive order that uh, caused a lot of federal employees to lose their employment. And we should consider doing the same sort of action as far as having a civilian review board look at the officer's actions and make a determination. This is what Trump assigned in 2018. And since this officer loves Trump, we should do this as well, because this would be falling in line, allowing a civilian review board to look at officers' actions. Because Trump did it and they like Trump, this should be something we should assign to them. Um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, like I said, it's really disheartening to understand um, how this officer could equate asking for respect and equity um, as a terrorist action, and uh, I would, you know, I, I just, I just want to go on record saying that this is devastating and heartbreaking to have this, this take place, and that we can do better, and we should be doing better. And education and training is also um, 
we need to um, also seriously consider so that these sort of mishaps and um, uh, conversations can, can move in a more positive direction. Thank you so much. Kim, Kim before you sign off, uh, you forgot to state your address for the record, please. Oh, 181 Boston Avenue. Thank you. Next is Stephanie Phillips. Everyone, Yarwood Street. Thank you very much for the time to talk. Um, I do want to reference the recent events on the Facebook posting by Sergeant Rivera. Um, I recognize that some of the steps that the administration has taken to address comments of Mr. Rivera um, were positive. Um, and I certainly don't want to repeat comments that uh, my predecessors, I agree with all of them who have spoken, uh, particularly those of Reverend Ford. Uh, but I do want to emphasize again, and as many times as it's needed, that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist organization, nor is the Black Lives Movement targeting police officers. The meeting with the NAACP and the invitation of Reverend Lord to speak to the officers at roll call is a good first step, but it doesn't address the statements that Mr. Rivera made which have taken this department's progress with the good officers that we have backwards. Calling his statement disappointing or poor judgment does not convey that our leaders understand the damage, the fear that is within our community, particularly of color, our boys, our men. His comments have contributed to a narrative that is divisive. How can we trust his split second judgment with dealing with minorities in that critical time where we need their help, not their violence. I believe the actions, I believe there, I believe the following actions will restore some public trust and I'd like to offer some recommendation. Mr. Rivera, as any officer, should be held to a higher standard of conduct. The statement should have violated the department's code of conduct, which includes off duty and social media behavior. He must face discipline. At the very minimum, he should be suspended immediately. He should be remanded to take counseling and several cultural bias training programs and possibly others. A public dialogue should begin immediately to include groups such as CARE in addition to the NAACP, which was created for such events and to help heal our community. Leaders should reinforce at every public opportunity, each meeting and dialogue that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist movement. Systematic racism does exist in Stratford. Systemic racism does exist in Stratford. And our best course is to come together for mutual understanding is to have open, honest dialogue at every level. I also support Councilman Caitlin Shake's call to declare racism a public health crisis. What we need now is to come together as a community and to fight those feelings and help our community to understand that we all love our town. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's nobody else on my list. Okay, so we're going to close the public forum at 7.13 p.m. And the public hearing on the cell tower will start at 7.30. Thank you, everybody. This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call the public hearing of September 14th, 2020 to order at 7.31 p.m. My name is Ken Poisson, 6th District Councilman and Town Council Chairman Pro Tem. I'm sitting in for Chairman Chris Pia, who had surgery today. Uh, this public hearing is solely on the lease with Crown Castle Towers for the construction of a monopole cell tower on town property located on Hickory Woods Lane. That is all that is being discussed at this public hearing. Margo, we're all set. Okay, first up is Anthony Martinetti. Okay, um, first of all, I'm at 645 Chapel Street. 
um, just east of Hickory, uh, just west of Hickory Woods Lane. Um, I don't know much information about the proposed location of the monopole cell tower. What I do know is that the sign that was posted for this notice of hearing is about 20 feet away from my property line. Um, so my first concern would be the proximity of this cell tower to my property. Um, one concern that I have is the effects on property value for my property and surrounding properties. Another concern that I have is I was led to believe that the property that's owned by the town south of my property is uh, wetlands. And the concern I have with building a cell tower on wet wetlands would be the structural stability and potential for collapse of this cell tower. Um, also, health concerns with rays from cell tower is another concern of mine. Um, according to the American Cancer Society, the theory of cell towers causing cancer is undetermined. So it's not proven that these could cause cancer, but it's also not disproven. So that's not enough scientific information for me to feel comfortable with this cell tower. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up is Ron Solano. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Solano. Uh, I'm at uh, 310 Hickory Woods Lane. And um, uh, with regard to this meeting, uh, all I have is a draft of the site sketch. And uh, in the interest of time, I share all the same concerns as Anthony um, regarding his comments, uh, particularly, uh, as he said, the effect that would have on property values. Uh, having power built in wetlands, there's an impact on wetlands. Um, we have no idea what type of cell tower is going to be built. Uh, there's a lack of information on, uh, on this project from us as residents. All we were notified of is there's a public hearing, and I could not, through town people, I only got a copy of a map, and that's all I'm looking at. So uh, my concerns are in the wetlands area, affecting property value, the impacts of a cell tower in our community. Uh, we're a very um, tight community here, and uh, this would be pose a, a very big impact on our property values. And the environmental impact would be great as well. And I feel, my wife and I feel totally uncomfortable with having such a, a tower built and in a, in a wetland, which leads to other things about the structural uh, process and stability of such a, uh, such a tower. And uh, we have no idea what type of tower this is. In doing my homework, there were different types of towers. So uh, we have, as a community, we have a lack of information. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next is Donna Mosqua. Hold on, Donna, let me get you unmuted. Okay, there you go. Okay, <laughs> um, I live at 202 Hickory Woods Lane. And according to um, the maps, it's a, it's a residential zone one. Um, the Stratford GIS map designates it as a wetland. Um, so therefore it would have to be surveyed, which I don't see any markers out there. So I, I don't think it has been. The zoning regulation section 3.28 item G states that the tower must be a monopole. It must be 50 feet from residential areas, playgrounds, and schools. It also has to be 50 feet from inland wetlands and no more than a maximum height of 100 feet. If all that criteria is met, then it also has to be camouflaged. We've heard nothing in regards to any of that. That being said, none of the 70 plus people in the condos or the surrounding neighborhood want this as it will be seen from all of our windows and lower the value of our homes and our health. 
we don't want this. The tower financially makes the town gain, and it also makes the cell phone company gain, and we lose. We really do not want it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Ronnie Dubrowin. Hi, this is Ronnie Dubrowin. I live at 303 Hickory Woods Lane. And uh, actually, everything I was going to say has been said by each speaker. I agree with each speaker. Donna said it very well. So, so did Ron. So did each speaker. Uh, the other thing I'd like to remind people of as we take a look at this as the area behind our condos is um, a wildlife area and we certainly don't want that impacted by a tower there's also a tower right across the street so i don't understand why there has to be one that would impact us the the create the erection of this would even imp impact our going in and out to get to our homes there's only one entrance exit to this community and we cannot have that impacted at all so we i Myself and my husband are firmly against this project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's the last person that I have signed up. Okay, so the uh, public hearing is closed at 7.38 p.m. The town council meeting will start promptly at 8 p.m. Thank you, everybody. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Poison. I'm the sixth district councilman and council chairman pro tem. I'm running the meetings tonight because council chairman Chris Pia had surgery today and we wish him a speedy recovery. I'm going to call the town council meeting of September 14th, 2020 to order at 8.01 p.m. The next item on the agenda is the invocation and pledge of allegiance. Councillor Dancho, it is your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lord God, may we be grateful for our good fortunes and compassionate towards all those who are suffering every kind of distress at this difficult time. May we hold back nothing and continue our work as ministers of sound guidance and doing good in times of need. For this, we thank you, Lord. Amen. And for the pledge, yes, I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and, and to the Republic of the United States of America and to the Republic of the Okay, next up is the approval of minutes from uh, August 10th and the special meeting of August 31st. I'll take a motion to approve. Chair, if I may, Dave Harden approve the motion. Hey, do we have a second? Bill O'Brien, I'll second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Chair, Chair votes aye, motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, could you just note for the record, uh, are all members present with the exception of uh, Chairman uh, Pia? I, I believe that's what Margo said, correct, Margo? Yes, all are present except Mr. Pia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so the motion carries 9-0. Is that what you're getting at, Mr. Town Attorney? Yes, sir. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, we have no uh, ceremonial presentations or awards tonight. So next up, item three is uh, communications, bills, petitions, and remonstrances. Uh, we have two letters of resignation that are listed on the agenda for information only. Item 3.2 is the monthly tax. And I'll turn it over to our finance director, Dawn Savo. Dawn, are you there? <clears throat> if I could kindly remind everybody to please mute yourself if you're Against not talking. Cash flow report. 
Go ahead, Dawn. Thank you. There was a cash. Thank you. There was a cash flow that was included with the minutes to um, the council members, and um, there were some adjustments that were made to it to by the treasurer just to reduce the income. Um, she was wanted to wanted to be a little more. Um, uh, conservative on that and increase the expenses slightly, but we're still in good shape. And if anybody has any questions, we don't have we don't need to borrow any money right now, um, as it anticipated for the uh, tax purposes. <clears throat> any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Dawn? Okay. Um, Chairman Poison, it's Greg Can. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Um, hello, Don. Uh, the report is many hello. pages. Hi, Don. <laughs> the report is many pages, and it kind of projects weekly activities going through the end of the fiscal year. Uh, which row in this report would give us the best indication of a risk that the town may need to go into borrowing money, if you will, or using the bonded? Well, we're, according to this report, we're, we're good through, uh, all the way through July of next year. That's when things, um, when this report, and I think some of these numbers I think are, um, underestimates in the in the revenue will like i have mentioned previously we'll have a much better understanding of where we are after january's collections that's that's the um, wild card here so once we see i mean obviously um july's collections went very well we're on target we didn't have any problems so we're waiting to see what happens in january as our most other towns that I've talked to. Um, can I, I'd like to ask a specific question just to, in about the middle of the page, there's a row that says debt service, parentheses, paid from STIF. Um, could you just, and then let's say for um, the 17th of, August, which the month has just passed, it has an $11 million figure. Um, can you describe what does that rep? What does that row represent? So, um, debt services, any of the bond payments or note payments that the town is required to make, we've scheduled them on the cash flow, so they're included. And if they change, they you know if we um, changed if any of that changed, we, it would be noted there. Um, the STIF is the stiff account. It's an account that we have uh, with the state um, treasurer department, and it is we move money into there, and they make the bond payments directly for us to U.S. Bank. So it's, it's just a place where we park money to then have the bond payments made. And we earn interest. We earn, you know, the interest rate was much better there. So that's why we had opened that. So it's just account. another expense that's due during that weekly or monthly period. Right, so that 11 million was the pension bond payment. So that was that was due. Okay, thank you for the report. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Dawn. Uh, item 3.3 .3 is a presentation by Jeffrey Fletcher uh, about a, a potential African American museum. And Jeffrey, I'm going to have uh, the mayor introduce. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeffrey Fletcher to you. Jeffrey came to meet with Mike Downs and myself over a year ago with Devney, explaining um, 
his passion for African American history and um, his his own professional journey as a police officer and yeah. a journey that actually allowed you the luxury luxury air quotes of um, increasing this collection and traveling around the country and um, we just thought it was so fascinating and actually we were so pleased Jeffrey that you wanted to come to Stratford that um, we had a, asked a few counselors to meet with Jeffrey and kind of vet his idea a little bit and so um, we thought it was great uh, would be a great opportunity for all the town council to hear what Jeffrey's proposing for our community so Jeffrey Hi. thank you for joining thank us thank you yeah thank you good evening and thank you uh, Mayor Hoydick and thank you to the town council for allowing me the opportunity uh, to meet with you um, yes Laura uh, Laura was right Mayor Hoydick was right um, in that uh, when I knocked on her door a year ago on a frigid day and uh, came in with this idea um, that I think um, would be embraced and uh, and looked at uh, very open-mindedly is uh, the collection. And uh, just let me take a second or so to uh, let you know uh, my travels and who I am. So I was raised in Colchester, Connecticut, which is everybody knows the rural uh, town tucked rural town tucked in the uh, southeastern corner of Connecticut all my life. Uh, my parents were, um, uh, they, they migrated from the south uh, during the Jim Crow segregation period of, uh, of history. And uh, all along that journey, um, my mom and my mom and, her, and my dad and their, their uh, travels had um, collected brick brack and things of that nature. Um, to cut through all of that as they migrated to the Northeast, um, their collection, their um, uh, heart and passion for collecting uh, items of African-American um, uh, history uh, increased. Um, upon my, mo my mom's passing, um, she had left a collection, uh, which I didn't think it was as big as it was until I arrived at my home, childhood home in Colchester to receive the things that she had packed away in terms of degrees and um, uh, uh, trophies and plaques. Uh, to my amazement, I saw um, just rows and rows of Tupperware. And uh, my dad had said to me, these are yours. And uh, I had said to myself, my life is only a, a, a Tupper, a rubber Tupper made uh, uh, container. What is all these uh, 14 and 15 containers consist of? So to my belief, I opened up one and my dad said, you got to take them all. So I took them home to my home uh, in, here in Brantford, Connecticut. Uh, as Mayor Hoydick said, uh, I spent 23 years as a, a police officer in the city of New Haven. And um, upon my retirement, these containers were still there. And as I started to look through them, I realized that uh, I couldn't hold on to this. This was obscure junk. And uh, at that point, as I talked to my daughter, I said that I needed to get rid of these things. I had an epiphany, and the epiphany was a kink in my neck. And I think it was a spiritual uh, uh, awakening from my mom telling me to, I better hold on to this stuff. So I held on to it and decided to uh, uh, figure out what this was meaning, what, what the meaning of this was. And um, I, it dawned on me one day, and I realized that these items were a story about her life and my dad's life as they were growing up as young adult, young uh, people in the South during Jim Crow and segregation. So what I decided to do was to start to think about how could I continue their legacy. And uh, at that point, as Mayor Hoydick pointed out, uh, I decided to um, package everything, most of the things at that time, and it was about maybe five, six hundred pieces, and pick, select certain items and start to uh, uh, knock on doors to schools, civic organizations, and colleges. Um, the reception was lukewarm, but then it started to get better. And as it started to get better, I got bit by the auction bug and putting my shingle out there. And uh, people started donating. And I started to find myself going on auctions across the country, across the world. And um, now the collection is up to 3,500 to 4,000 pieces of African-American African artifacts, which uh, span from the 1619 to uh, present day, through uh, as well as civil rights. Um, I, can, I can probably spend 
at least a couple hours here, but I'm not because of lack of time. And thought I'd give you a, a, a little thumbnail sketch of what it, what it is. So my, my position here is that this is important history. I think it's history that um, uh, it affords families, it affords educational institutions to uh, have access to uh, original um, artifacts. And one of the main uh, drives here in, in how I chose Stratford, not only did uh, May Hoydick and Michael Downs open their arms and embrace this, um, I started to think about uh, you know what benefits it could it could bring to Stratford because you always have people that want to come to a community and they want to see what they can take. I want to see what I can put back and install into this uh, community. And I truly believe being I-95 being the major hub and uh, and thorough thoroughway through uh, from the south to uh, north. I said uh, this is an ideal place one for economy purposes, but as well as to um, have people stop through foot traffic. Uh, and plus it affords families here in the Northeast the opportunity to see the similar items and artifacts that uh, they have at the National African American History Museum. And again, like I said, I'd be here all night trying to uh, give you a, a catalog uh, a view into the collection. So um, there are a host of number of reasons why uh, I believe Stratford is the uh, could be the place, the home for this uh, collection, which um, will, uh, I know for a fact in my heart, my passion that uh, it's a drawing. Um, it will draw to the, the community, the greater uh, uh, Fairfield County um, communities. And Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Jeffrey about the museum? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, Chair uh, Paul Tavares, to the chair. Yes, Paul. Yeah, go Paul. Ahead. How are you doing, Mr. Fletcher? Um, I remember seeing uh, a lot of your artifacts. I believe you had uh, presentations at Bird's Eye School and the Baldwin Center. Yes, I yes I did. As a matter of fact, uh, both of those um, um, venues were have been very generous in the sense of um the the public relations and as well as the attendance uh that uh flowed through the doors uh to see on those several days that i, I was uh displaying artifacts yes are, are you looking for a permanent venue yes I, I am very much am um i've had uh many offers um out of state but i i truly believe this is uh this is my home connected to my home and the the collection expands um, to native um, uh, residents of Connecticut who have made an impact on the civil rights movement, uh, women's movement. Um, uh, just the other day, uh, Congress, uh, I was uh, speaking with a number of uh, people in uh, Hartford about uh, you know just uh, this whole museum uh, concept and tentatively telling them where I wanted to uh, plant this uh, collection. And uh, they were enthusiastic on both sides of the uh, aisle, um, right and the left, uh, because I, I, I truly believe this is the beginning of that conversation of real history and, and, um, and being able to come in contact with the artifacts and face to face, um, be able to touch them as well. I tell you, I would I would love if something was established here in Stratford with the diversity of our town and, and especially uh, the history that needs to be exposed for our young folks. Uh, I certainly would like to do whatever I can to try to get to have a home here. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, you know, Stratford is full of history. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like what you call a lay historian. Um, I, I didn't uh, I, I graduated from the University of New Haven, and my major was psychology. And uh, I've always been attracted to history since uh, grade school, high school, and um, traveling to various museums throughout the uh, Northeast and the country. And what I found is that Stratford has an abundance of history. I spent, you know, the last year and a half, I've spent as much time in Stratford as I have spent 
in my home in Brantford here in Connecticut because I, I, I'm getting phone calls and uh, uh, Bill O'Brien has uh, been real, real <laughs> helpful in guiding and De Devney Warsdale have been real helpful in guiding me through uh, to all of those historic places that are in um, Stratford uh, along the coast there and in the historic district. So I, I think it's a, it will be an uptick to the historic uh, community and it's, and it's a good walk um, uh, that I believe um, would uh, uh, be vigorating and intellectual for all to see and to attend. You need to talk to Mr. David Wright. I mean, I tell you, I had a cup of coffee and I just, I, I could have stayed all day listening to Wright. He's a walking historian also. Thank you. Yes, thank you. David David uh, was very helpful in um, uh, giving me a, 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 a brief introductory to some of the pe one of the pieces in Stratford, which is um, uh, a silhouette that uh, Flo uh, I guess her name is Flora, and that's on loan to the Smithsonian, uh, I think, as we speak right now. And um, I mean, uh, let alone just that piece alone is uh, terrific. But I don't think the, the the country, I don't think Connecticut, I don't think the the country knows how um, how uh, uh, how much history is there in Stratford. I think, you know, with the the loss of the Stratford, the Shakespeare Theater, um, you know, I I, I think that. Uh, um, gained a lot of news and has been a mainstay for decades in Stratford, but um, I truly believe that uh, there are other um, institutions within Stratford, historical institutions in Stratford, and uh, if I'm approved to come there, uh, it'll be another uh, piece to Stratford as well um, that can uh, help to educate and to enlighten um, everyone, all cultures. Thank you, sir. Okay, Bill O'Brien, you're next. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Hey, I've had the pleasure of some great conversations with Jeffrey and have learned much from him. And I could go on an hour myself, Jeffrey, with some of the things you've told me about. I always have to tell about your uh, mother having all that stuff in your bedroom because I love that story. And you came home from college and said, what's all this junk? <laughs> and I'm just uh, glad this has happened. But can you tell everybody your website? And I would encourage everyone to go to the website and read the Starbucks story. Yeah, um, okay, it's uh, www.AfricanAmericanCollections, and I always tell people, make sure that there's an S at the end of collections.com. Um, the the uh, Starbucks, um, uh, the Starbucks case is very interesting, and, and it, you know, it tells a lot about who I am, and it, uh, it transcends more than just what they're when you read the uh, go to the website and see that section. And to add is that um, I shared with Bill um, one of the original. Um, this I, I I'm just two things that happened within the last 12, 24 hours. And I just need to share this. Um, so one of the original uh, Greensboro four who sat at the uh, lunch counter at uh, F W Woolworth. He is. Um, a part of this um, museum and collection. Um, and uh, he's right here in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, he's waiting. He's a, a, uh, he's a spry 81-year-old uh, who has a lot of stories to share about his um, moments with Rosa Parks and Dr. King after they uh, made that historic uh, movement happen there. As well as uh, Saturday, I was uh, gifted by uh, one of only four um, Tuskegee Airmen who resided from Connecticut, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Captain um, Edward T. Um, Captain Edward Simmons um, gave me, his family gave me his uh, personal belongings to um, actually uh, exhibit in the collection. And uh, I'm, I'm elated by that because we are going to feature his image, his person, as his uh, his person in the uh, museum as well. So there's tons of history, tons of pictures, articles of him training at Tuskegee Institute, uh, him with his uh, comrades. Um, it, it, it's a treasure trove. Okay, let me his, just... name is, his name is Dixon. I don't know. I, his name was Captain Edward T. Dixon, D-I-X-O-N. I'm sorry. 
let me just finish by saying um, I hope sooner than later we get the museum here. And then after that, I hope we can twist your arm and your wife's arm to move to Stratford. <laughs> Uh, that, that's that's a big twist, <laughs> but not because of Stratford, but because uh, she's set in her ways. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Bill. Anybody else have any questions for Jeffrey? Uh, Chairman Poussin, it's Greg Can. Go ahead, Greg. Mr. Fletcher, thank you for the uh, presentation and for your uh, your efforts to collect these uh, these history. Uh, do you have a timeline for when you'd like to see the museum accomplished? And do you have an idea on the size, let me just say square foot of display area that you would believe uh, appropriate? Well, right now I'm, I'm still trying to figure out and, uh, and discuss with Michael and Laura um, about uh, the, the the logistics of this, um, but to actually be able to uh, have this to be effective, uh, it, it will need uh, quite a quite a bit of space, and uh, it can be from anywhere from a thousand square feet to six thousand square feet of space, um, and and I'm being generous only because the the collection is. 4,000 pieces, and if you can imagine um, the cataloging and just having all of these things out of my storage, out of my basement, um, and into an open space, it would probably consume um, a large space. So to answer the question about the proposed time and date, um, it could take anywhere from uh, a, a year to two uh, to a year and a half. Um, and based on the p other pieces that are going with this is that uh, which is uh, Rhode Island School of Design is uh, going to curate as well as to design the floor plans of this. Um, that's a working agreement that I have with the director of, of uh, curating and museum from the school because they were passionate as I am to uh, want to be uh, on the first floor of uh, designing the first African-American history museum in Connecticut, as well as uh, for New England. So what they've agreed upon was to, uh, in a sense, pro bono, do the work because the graduate students that are in the program there um, would need to uh, have experience in doing this. So I, I kind of dodged a, a bullet uh, because uh, if we all know in terms of having a designer come into your home and try to figure out uh, what goes and what doesn't, um, that can cost you hundreds and thousands of dollars alone to do that. So I've uh, been blessed with uh, Rhode Island School of Design to uh, actually come in and start running off the ground wherever the um, museum is going to be uh, located. Okay, thank you again, sir. Yes, sir, thank you. Ken, you're muted. I'm sorry. Jeffrey, I just wanted to say that uh, I personally would be honored to have a museum like this in Stratford, and especially if it's the first one in all of New England, I think it'd be a, a great home for it. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to, to add to that, and, and there's a whole host of things going through my mind, and I thought I'd be able to have them written, but I, I usually am effective when, you know, I have questions and, and I'm uh, not scripted. But to add to that, um, and again, I mentioned um, it's, it's, it will be feasible because I've been to the African American Museum down in uh, Washington, D.C. at least three times, and I, my relatives live in Maryland and in the uh, Virginia area. And I know for a fact that for travel, for lodging, for food, it can, it can cost a family maybe of two or four at least two thousand dollars. I'm I'm not kidding. Including the entrance to get into the museum, um, money. And I and I know our families right now we're they're due to the pandemic, um, and we don't know how long this is going to last. But I'm I'm just conceptualizing the fact that this is going to be with us for a while. Um, 
I truly believe that uh, having something this close will be cost effective for families to be able to come and visit, get in the car and come to see this in the Northeast. So when you think about this type of venue, uh, you think about the Schomburg, which is in New York, or you think about the National Museum, and then you think about the Civil Rights Museums in uh, Greensboro, as well as Tennessee, um, Memphis, you got to say to yourself, uh, to me, I think this is a, uh, and I'm, I'm probably partial on a bias on this. I think what I have to offer um, is a uh, treasure as well as a uh, an institution of learning for uh, families uh, in the Northeast and especially right there in the in the backyard of Stratford, literally. Anybody else have any questions for Jeffrey? Jeffrey, thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you, sir. And thank you, uh, Mayor Hoydick and Town Council for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, next up on the agenda is uh, item 4.1, uh, Mayor's Report. Thank you, Council Chairs. So, uh, COVID updates, we have 907 cases in Stratford and 41 probable cases of today for a total of 948 cases. This represents an increase of five confirmed cases since our last report of September 11th. And unfortunately, we have uh, 79 deaths, related deaths. Uh, the conclusion of storm Isaiah's cleanup, uh, the yards of debris. As you know, that on the storm came on August 4th, which we've had a, a council meeting after that, but I just wanted to tell you that the public works operation ran from August 5th, seven days a week through August 21st, just for the main, um, the main pickup of clearing the streets and the roadways, and that was 18 days, and they worked 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. each day, um, cleaning up all 833 streets over 200 miles of road. They used a lot of heavy um, duty equipment and they cleaned up um, 72 locations of schools, uh, 833 acres, um, both the two high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, all the parks and, and uh, the town buildings. So it was quite an extensive job and I'm uh, really, really proud of the Public Works Department and how hard they worked. Um, so kudos to Mo McCarthy and his crew. Uh, as all of you, I'm sure all of you know, we had a social media issue with uh, Sergeant Rivera. Uh, the NAACP had a meeting with uh, Chief McNeil and Sergeant Rivera. Um, we are working through the processes of addressing this issue um, and there will be more to come I'm sure later uh, if you have any questions, but I just want to reiterate that this is a personal matter as we're moving forward, listening to the community, hearing their concerns, addressing their concerns as best we can. Um, and I will brief you and we can uh, talk about it more in executive session if you need to. On September 11th, we had the uh, ceremony at the VFW. Uh, JP Straczynski was promoted to a dispatch superintendent. The presentation of the new, Benel, the new American flag at Benel was given by the Stratford VFW. Uh, at the end of the report, Mike is going to report on the infrastructure upgrades. Stratford Point was chosen by the American Sh Shore and Beach Preservation Association as one of the three nationwide winners for their second annual Best Restored Award. The CARES program at the Baldwin Center has been uh, suspended and we are offering alternative resources to families. The Health Department Town Flu Clinic is Wednesday the 23rd from 12 to 5 at Stratford EMS. Raymark Superfund closure of Longbrook Avenue happened, uh, what's today, the 14th happened today, started. It'll be closed for about a month while they do some road reconstruction. The swearing in of Officer Ariel uh, Leon Jr. happened uh, on Friday 
think it was Friday. Um, we are hosting a local business job bank. Stratford businesses featured in Connecticut Magazine Best of Issue are Cricket for the Best Hot Dog, Stratford Antiques, the Best Antique Shop, Gaetano's Deli for the Best Deli, Two Roads Oktoberfest was the Best Beer Festival, Athletic Brewing Wild Run IPA, More Stuff We Love, that was an interesting category, Uberti's was the Best Fish Market, Station House Wine Bar was, guess what, the Best Wine Bar, Rotary Ski and Snowboard, the Best Ski Shop, Mellow Monkey had three designations, best home decor, best lighting, best unique gifts. Two Roads Too Juicy was the best beer, and Nature's Way was the best health food store. We recognized Overdose Awareness Day on August 31st. The Long River Park cleanup uh, sponsored by Councilor Shake is October 3rd at 8 a.m. Everyone's meeting at Marcus Drive. The VFW is holding a blood drive on Thursday from one to six in conjunction with the Red Cross at uh, 100 Veterans Boulevard, which is the BFW, you need to call or reserve online um, reservations for giving blood with the Red Cross. So um, we've had a little difficulty again with absentee ballots. We had it with the primary and now we've had it, we're experiencing again with the general election. So the return address on the envelope that was sent to Stratford voters says Stafford. Um, there's, real, there's nothing wrong with the ballot that is the outside return address. When you open up the ballot, you'll see that the mailing address on the envelope is in fact the Stratford Town Clerk's uh, address. So everything will be fine. You can, you can process your ballot just as you normally would. Um, the Secretary of State made that error. Hopefully we're the only town that made the error is, but the good thing is the town clerk in the town of Stratford, uh, Stafford, excuse me, is getting the envelopes and sending them down to Susan or Pollock, our town clerk. Uh, it seems like we're just having difficulty with these mail-in ballots all over the place. <clears throat> but um, they work, and once you get your ballot, you can either mail it or you can put it in the drop box at town hall. And then uh, last but not least, we had ribbon cutting at Dunkin Donuts and it was more like a um, a reopening. They were welcoming customers back because now customers could come inside. They were just don't have to go through the drive through. Council Chair and that's the report. Thank you Madam Mayor. Uh, item 4.2 is questions for the mayor. Questions. Paul Tavares, uh, questions for the mayor. Paul Tavares through the chair. Yes, Paul, go ahead. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. Um, did you say that you wouldn't be entertaining any questions tonight about the officer in question? You said there was a... Is that a, a... Chris? Oh, I'm sorry, I unmuted myself. Yes, if we're gonna discuss this uh, individual, it would have to be put on an agenda, the employee would have an opportunity to have the discussion in executive session, plus um, it'd be premature to comment on this matter. Okay, thank you. Councilman Poison, can you hear me? Yes, Kayla. Sorry, there's an echo. Mayor Hoydick, I'd like to um, ask a few questions. Oh, where'd you go? Mayor Hoydick? Yes, Counselor. Sorry, my screen is like flashing and I'm getting like an echo. There we go. Um, and perhaps Mr. Ha my question is in regards to the statement that the mayor's office put out. Can I ask that question here? Chris, if you'd like, if you could direct me. Caitlin, why don't you ask the question and then he'll he can respond. 
Okay. Um, my question is regard is in regards to, um, I guess, the perspective of what was deemed to be um, appropriate language in the response to what was put out on social media. Um, our chief of police and um, in publications from the NAACP of the Bridgeport chapter um, were able to communicate with the public uh, that those two entities had come to the conclusion that the Black Lives Matter movement is in fact not a terrorist organization. And I was hoping that we could um, hear from you directly in regards to why that was not included in the statement from the mayor's office. After hearing, I've gotten numerous emails from constituents and spoken to people throughout the town. Um, and as we heard through the public hearing earlier, um, there is an absolute necessity for us and responsibility as elected officials and I feel personally also as a healthcare practitioner, as a nurse, um, that we clarify and rectify um, when statements are made inappropriately and inaccurately, that we preserve you know, the integrity of this entire body so that we have the trust of the public. So my question is, are, is there going to be a follow-up from the mayor's office and in lieu of that, also from the town council, that we do not agree and that we do not believe that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization? So Caitlin, you're asking me to respond based on the officer's comments and I didn't make those comments. And no one on this town council or in the administration said that they concur with the officer's comments. So my response to you, as was my response at attending all the vigil and also the two rallies, that of course Black Lives Matter. So my question, if I could respond, my question was in regards to why in the statement that was put out to the public that we did not clarify that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist organization. Just for clarification. So, so again, I'm saying to you, you are asking the town of Stratford, the administration, the council to respond from the officer's statement, which is not something that we have ever said or we believe in. So why, why do we need to is that an issue for you, Caitlin? Would you, would you like us to all, in the resolution that you're gonna put forward next month, maybe we could just talk about that too? Is that how you wanna handle this? So two different issues. The first issue is the question well, that I'm asking. Yes, it's and racism. Correct, and correct. and we, are, we are fostering anti-racism. Okay. I do not want to foster racism in any way, shape, or form in this entire body of elected officials. And my question is, again, in the, sta in the statement that the NAACP of the Bridgeport chapter put out, they clarified that the Black Lives Matter movement is not a terrorist organization. Is that a statement that we're not comfortable, or, or the administration, I should say? is not comfortable to make. It is a statement based on Officer Rivera's comments and this administration does not believe it is a terrorist organization. Thank you. Do you? I absolutely do not sure. believe that the Black Lives Matter movement. Then I'm glad we're on the same page, Counselor. Thank you, because I have received, like I said. Of course. I know people I are very upset, counselor, and we it's our duty to listen to them and to work our way through this because one officer's sentiments does not represent the administration, nor frankly, do the NAACP statements represent this administration or town. There were 
misfacts, misrepresentations made in the last statement I saw by Reverend Lord. I'd like to repeat them right now. Of all departments in this town, the Stratford Police Department has the highest minority ratio of employees. Our ratio of 25% is more than the demographics of minorities in Stratford. So in the future, in fact, I plan to be with Reverend Lord tomorrow and to talk to him about next time he issues a statement about Stratford that maybe he concurs with the administration prior to issuing it. Well, thank you for clarifying because again, I think that it's vitally important for residents throughout our entire town. Caitlin, and please stick with questions. Questions for the mayor. I'm just responding to the comments that the mayor made and I'm glad that um, we were able to publicly say that right now. Um, my next question is in regards to, um, I've received a couple emails regarding public pop-up testing sites for COVID. I had sent um, an email to the health department um, asking if Stratford was going to be the health department or with Optimus if we were going to be providing more pop-up testing sites, especially since school has started. Does the town have any plans? Yes, and the town has been doing them, as you know. Um, we've been working with Optimum, Optimus. Uh, we're also working with the governor's office to set up, uh, I think the meeting is tomorrow, to set up additional pop-up testing. I couldn't agree with you more, um, Caitlin, that uh, especially with the likelihood that we are going to have more positive COVID cases and we need not only pop-up testing, but we need rapid testing for first responders and essential employees, um, that we really are working hard to get uh, the program together. Larry Ciccarelli is working with Bernie Bova, Andrea Boisevin from the health department and Greta Berniel, and they are working uh, hand in glove with Kim Velasquez from the school system. So um, yes, we are, and hopefully we'll have more information for you, uh, probably not tomorrow, but then the day thereafter. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Tavares through the chair. Yes, Paul. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, are any counselors uh, invited to this meeting that you're having with the Reverend tomorrow? And, and if not, why not? Uh, no counselor. And no, no reason for that? No reason. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for the mayor? Mr. Chairman, Bill O'Brien, quickly. Yes, Bill. Uh, I got an email today from CCM that we're getting 49876 to help with election expenses. That's great. And Laura, have you heard anything on FEMA money from the storm? Is there a chance we'll get some FEMA money? Uh, there's, we are applying for FEMA money, and Dawn can talk about it more specifically if you have um, specific questions. The actual money that we're getting for the elections is more like 58000 um, As Dawn predicted, though, it's not going to be enough to cover the expenses that we're incurring between the registrar's office and the town clerk's office. And so um, we're very conscious that we need to keep track of all these additional expenses since the FEMA reimbursement is an application, it's not a guarantee. And um, and as Dawn mentioned when she gave the TAN report, you know, we're, we're okay right now, but we don't know how the collections are gonna go in January. And so we are very careful not to incur too many additional expenses. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ken, it's Greg Cam. Yes, Greg, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor Hoydick, there's two projects I'd like to get a timeline for, if you will. Uh, one may be, one is our housing partnership has been actively meeting and a timeline on when they'll be able to say, reach out for public input or publish their conclusions. And the second item is we may have regarding Shakespeare theater property. Uh, there's an electrical improvement project that was budgeted a while ago. And then we may have leftover insurance money that we could use for uh, short term 
to use that phrase, improvement to the property in lieu of a long-term solution. Uh, can you speak briefly to each of those two? I can, Greg. Thank you for um, asking the questions. So just bear with me. So I asked Chris Timniak today to confirm that we don't have any bond money left for Shakespeare, and we do not. Um, we are currently, so you're right, the plan was to improve all the electrical at the property, but um, the storm kind of got in the way, so we have to take, we are delaying a little bit, but the idea is to get the electricity all really working on the property, so um, we could have some underground lighting, and you know, if we have food trucks there that they won't have to run the diesel or the engines the whole time, they can just plug them in so it'll be quieter. Um, the Shakespeare subcommittee is meeting at, in the middle, end of September, maybe. I think it's the 24th, actually. And they're going to be talking about the proposals for the property and the research everybody's done. As you know, um, Tom Evans is probably the most vocal of all the members of the, um, the subcommittee. And he has had his proposal on social media about the Globe. Um, the, the Globe Theater coming back to Shakespeare, so I'm sure that'll be on on the uh, on the discussion for the 24th. Um, Greg, you asked. Oh, the housing partnership. Yeah. Hold on, just one second. I have a lot of notes here, and they're all looking all over the place. <laughs> I apologize. Pop no apologies. Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk to it because um without looking at these notes, so. It's a massive amount of work, as you can imagine. And so what happened with the housing partnership is we started meeting monthly and realized we're never going to get anywhere fast if we don't meet more frequently. So we've been having our meetings around. They're all published, but they're, you know, either at lunchtime, like at one o'clock or earlier uh, in the evening. Um, so we can get through the agenda initially with the uh, consultant and then have something for the public. Uh, to comment on. So I think Sismitha is here. I, I know I saw her pop up. I don't know if she's still here, but Sismitha, would you mind answering um, the, about to Greg about the timeline? Um, so I, we are just meeting as a committee um, regularly every week right now, and um, the consultant has prepared a booklet of strategies for the partnership. Uh, and we are only halfway through that right now. And um, hopefully, like in the next two weeks, after we have discussed everything, we will be discussing a public engagement strategy. Um, our hope is to wrap up this report by um, end of November. And that's the timeline we're looking at right now. But it depends on how effectively the public engagement piece will be carried out as well. So um, that's where we are right now. Thanks, Smitha. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and one short follow-up, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, the bond money has been spent, but could we have any leftover, let's say, insurance money from when yeah. they completed the cleanup? So I think of it that way too, Greg. I think, oh, we have the insurance money, and so we have this in an encumbered account, but that's not how um, municipal accounting works, as Don has educated me. So. Um, it, the money went into the general fund, but if the town council should choose to take money expenses um, to allocate it towards the property, that, that they would have to do so. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Item 4.3.1 is building need committee. Mr. Chairman, this is Jim Connor from the 8th District. I'd like to make a motion to uh, resolve the Turner Corporate number 286, the amount of $26,187 for additional asbestos removal B and is by approved. This is Bill O'Brien, I'll second. And Chris, we're getting a lot of feedback. Attorney Chris, we're getting a lot of feedback. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, motion carries unanimously. Item 4.4 .4 is the town attorney's report. No report. Thank you, Grip. Thank you, Ken. Um, okay, thank you, Chris. Item Ken. 5 is unfinished business or old business. There is none. Item 6 is ordinances and resolutions. There are none. Uh, takes us to item 7, new business. Item 7.1 is the lease with the Crown Castle Towers on the cell. Um, on the cell tower. Uh, that was on tonight's agenda, uh, purely for informational purposes only, uh, as the town is still accepting uh, public input on this. Item 7.2 is uh, update on real estate negotiations and executive session is requested. Mr. Chairman, this is Laura Dancho, District 10. I move that we go into executive session to discuss the, pur the purchase of real estate as publicity regarding the site and purchase by the town would likely adversely impact the price of the property. The persons in attendance shall be the members of the town council, town attorney Chris Hodgson, assistant town attorneys Brian LeClaire, John Florek, and Bruce Jackson, Mayor Laura Hoydick, CAO Chris Christopher Timniak and Chief of Staff Mike Downs and Finance Director Don Savo. Mr. Chairman, this is Jim Connor from the 8th. I'll second that motion. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. David Wright and Margot, you're going to do what we did last time and uh, remove everybody? Yep. And then somebody let me know when you're back. Yes, yeah, someone will text you, Margot. Please also discontinue the recording. This conference will now, this conference will now be recorded. Sorry, he was right, that is a hair trigger. <laughs> this is Laura Dancho, District 10. I make a motion that we come out of executive session and that we offer. We need a second for that. Excuse me. Yeah, this is Jim, Jim Connor from the 8th District. Uh, second that. Okay, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The chair votes aye. The motion carries 9 0. Thank you. Um, and now the motion to proceed with the um, alternatives as discussed in executive session, authorizing the attorneys to proceed as discussed. Hey, is there a second? I'm seconded, seconded by Jim Connor from the 8th District. Hey, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. Motion carries 9-0. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Laura Dancho. Bill O'Brien, motion to adjourn. Aye. Right. Laura Dancho, seconded by Bill O'Brien. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned at 9.13 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time and effort. Thank you.